All right, good afternoon. It's uh, 101 p.m. Eastern. Welcome to Vision, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. The moment of reckoning that has engulfed America since the killing of George Floyd on top of the continuing fight against COVID-19 uh, has created specific demands for our democracy, uh, demands about how to ensure justice and equity for all, demands about how to keep a nation safe and healthy without crippling opportunity in society. But the moment is also raising general questions about what it is that makes our democracy work. We are seeing at once the common purpose and common cause that has propelled the American experiment to endure and in the eyes of many improve over time. But we are also seeing deep dissatisfaction and even despair about the state of our democracy and its ability to deliver on its lofty promises. For the past two years, well before the crises of the moment, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences has been convening a commission on these very questions. The Academy, founded in 1780, is the nation's oldest membership society dedicated to knowledge. And the commission, of which I was honored to be a member, was focused on the practice of citizenship in our democracy, exploring how to best respond to the weaknesses and vulnerabilities in our political and civic life, and how to enable more Americans to participate as effective citizens in a 21st century diverse democracy. And even though I was a commission member, uh, all of my recommendations were appropriately rejected. So there's no conflict in this conversation we're about to have. Um, and it's a critical conversation at a time when we are challenged to rise to what it really means to be an effective citizen in this democracy. I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen B. Heinz, who's president and CEO of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and co-chair of the American Academy Commission on the Practice of Democratic Citizenship, and also Antonio Hernandez, who serves as president and chief executive officer of the California Community Foundation, who is also a commissioner. So we've got a lot to discuss. We might go a little bit long today. And without further ado, therefore, I'd love to welcome Stephen and Antonio. Stephen, hi. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having us. Thank you for coming. And Antonia, I think hopefully is, here she is. Excellent. Uh, and you're still on mute. Uh, but uh, thank you. Thank you both for joining. Um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to start, Stephen, with you and really ask, Sort of the basics like wh why was this commission convened what what was the purpose yeah well thanks uh, to the audience for joining us for this discussion um so the you know the idea for the commission really began in 2017 so it was well before the crises of this moment um but it was with a sense that our democracy was in crisis that our representative democracy for many americans is neither very representative nor truly democratic and that it just isn't functioning, that the democracy is rigged, that their voice and their vote don't matter, and that the systems of governance are breaking down because it's not reaching them and, and changing their lives. So the Academy, which was founded, as you said, in 1780, to, to be of service to the nation in times of challenge, decided this was a, a topic that really needed to be addressed. Um, and to offer a bold plan for how we could essentially reinvent American democracy for the challenges of this century. So Antonio, when you heard this pitch and you were asked to join the commission, what was going through your mind? What were some of the signal issues, challenges in American democracy that were top of mind for you? Well, you know, my background is that I'm a civil rights lawyer. And for 18 years, I headed the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. I also worked in the Senate. And so the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1963, all those are issues that I care deeply about. And being in California, one of the most diverse places in the country, I knew that our democracy needed to be reimagined. Uh, the percentage of people voting, you know, on voting rights, you know, sort of all of the hindrances that are being put before people that we see and preventing them from vote. So to me, it was like, this is perfect. We need to reimagine our democracy, bring it to the 21st century, and really engage the next generation. So one of the things that really struck me um, in the process of this was one that the commission composition was incredibly diverse, you know, people from all walks of life, all sectors, ideologically diverse. And then also there was this uh, sort of incredible process of going out to communities 
across the country to ask people just very basic, not, not would you do this with our voting system or that, but really basic questions about what animates their attachment to our democracy, their concern about our democracy. And I sort of say all that to say, I, you know, having had a front row seat, the, the, there, there really was this, this whole range of things that were considered from democratic kind of habits and conventions to really concrete policy recommendations. You know, so, so I'd love to maybe first hear from you, Stephen, both about kind of what the major areas of recommendation are, but you know, how you narrowed, how you thought about that task of narrowing something that had emotional vectors, habit vectors, cultural vectors down to a really concrete set of recommendations. Yeah, well, it, it, it was, a, as you know, a, a complicated process uh, because from the very beginning, we were dedicated to, to having the commission represent the extraordinary diversity of this country in every respect, as you said. Um, and we worked hard to kind of build um, the culture of the commission itself, mm -hmm. a culture of participation and openness and honesty and curiosity. Um, and we did all the traditional things that national commissions do. We, you know, assembled a pile of data and analyzed it. We commissioned white papers. We studied all the literature in the field. Uh, we interviewed experts and we held conferences and seminars. And all of that was useful, useful. But frankly, the most important thing we did was listening to Americans. And as you, as you said, and we did it in over, in around 50 communities across the country. Really diverse set of them voices, you know, everything from a group of Somali women refugees in Minneapolis to conservative activists in Jackson, Mississippi, to a whole bunch of leaders in Los Angeles that Antonia brought together to first year cadets at the U.S. Naval Academy. I mean, we, we tried to listen to all kinds of voices and their voices are embedded in every page of this report. They were the decisive input to our work and that helped us both develop a framework and then a set of specific recommendations and helped us achieve consensus across this very broad and diverse group of uh, the members of the commission. And what, um, just quickly, Antonio, I wanna ask you a bit about how you've reacted to the recommendations, but what are the kind of three major buckets of, or the, the three major, the major buckets of recommendations? Uh, in the report. Do you want me to comment on that? Or yeah, please, Stephen, yeah. yeah So, you. yes, it's a, it's a really important point because I think this is one of the things that makes this report distinctive from other democracy reform proposals and reports. Um, we came quickly to understand that while the institutions and processes of democracy, government institutions, voting, all, all of those things that we think of as being kind of the core of democracy, they're, they're essential and they need to function well. They need to be representative, they need to be inclusive, and they need to be responsive to the needs and aspirations of the citizens. But the institutions alone are not enough. They rest on a political culture in our society and on the importance of civil society organizations, which is where citizens self-organize with each other to do things for the common good. And so our report offers recommendations in all three of those spheres because we believe very deeply that without vibrancy in all three, the institutions, the culture, and civil society, democracy will not be as, as powerful and as effective as it needs to be. And Antonio, what you know, having been through the process, and I and I know firsthand you were you know active advocate for some of the recommendations, a a trusted skeptic on other ones. Uh, you know what uh, what what are some of the recommendations that really have jumped out to you as being important that you've been sharing with other people as as things to pay attention to coming out of this process? Well, you know, it's interesting because one of the reactions, first initial reaction is this is another commission, it's a bunch of elitists, you know, they don't really get a sense of it. And the recommendations really aren't, you know, cutting edge. And so to me, first of all, is yes, they are. And a couple of them that I start that are my favorites, okay, one being a lawyer, you know, the fact that we're recommending that a term of the Supreme Court, yeah. you know, be 18 years. And they go, you're kidding. I said, 
and then they talk about, you know, life appointment and I explain all that stuff, but they go, really? And I said, and we're recommending to expand the House of Representatives by 50. He goes, oh, really? You're kidding. And so I go on and I think, you know, the reaction that I get is that these are serious. Skeptical, some of them say, well, you're going to need a constitutional amendment. And I said, not really. Maybe one, you know, maybe one, but the rest of them are in the hands of the people and the legislature, the governance structures. I said, we were very practical about that. And, you know, talking about consensus and, you know, being very uh, skeptical, it's true. Do I adore and believe in all of the recommendations? No. Some of my favorite, but for the good is the consensus. And this is what we as Americans have to do. It's the give and take of, you know, the whole in order for us to see ourselves in the middle. And so, but I'm very excited. And you know, the other thing, some simple stuff like recommending that national elections, presidential elections be on Veterans Day, common sense, you know, make it it's an expectation that this is the day everybody's going to vote in honoring of our veterans. You know, easing, same day registration, um, voting by mail, you know, all of those things that make it easy for people to participate. But I think, you know, the most important thing for me is the civic engagement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting people to feel that they have input. And in and, and reality, in all these 50 meetings, to some degree, it's happening at the local level. And, you know, instead of saying that change is going to come from the national down, it's really going to emerge from the bottom up, from localities. And people feel much more connected to their local government and totally disconnected to the federal government. So I think this is an opportunity for all of us who have been working in the civic engagement world to really sort of activate the grassroots, to embrace these changes, because I think that those are, that's where it's gonna come from. I do, and I do really agree. I mean, I think one of the strengths of the report, and I can, again, I can report from the front lines, you know, there was a real fastidiousness, I thought, in the process of making sure that the recommendations were practical. Not always to say incremental, but that mm -hmm. they were practical and could be implemented. And, I, and as someone who occasionally, you know, said, well, what, you know, wanted to throw something more radical out. Um, I, I think that was the right fidelity. I mean, we have really been thrust into a moment in which I think the, we are starting to see more clearly how different the world needs to be. And, 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 that, and you can collapse under the weight of that expectation and lose sight of the steps that can be taken today um, to build toward, toward a radically different kind of world. And that's actually, I want to stay with you, Antonia, on that question, because, you know, you you know, in your career has been about standing side by side with the people for whom this promise is not being fulfilled, for whom the democratic promise is not being fulfilled. And we are in a moment where, um, as painful as it is, so many of us are seeing that reflection now in the mirror and understanding what that really means for so many Americans, the ways that we're all implicated in, in the reality that that promise is systematically, designed, just systematically denied to so many. You know, what are, as, how are you thinking about this report in the context of this moment? You know, as someone who has been on the front lines of the fight for civil rights, what, where, it, either, either specifically in terms of the recommendations or something that we didn't talk about, you know, that you think is now a new demand or expectation of, of citizenship as an obligation in this country? You know, it, you know, there's a cliche, and I'm not very good with cliches, that it's awful to, you know, to, 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 do, to waste, you know, an opportunity for change. And that challenges are that opportunity. And for me, the coronavirus, coupled with the killing of African Americans, have put in our face the inequity, the discrimination, and you know the original sin. We can't look away from it. It was on our face. And you know, the growing gap in inequality, the, 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 the racism that has created infrastructures that don't allow everyone to you know, fulfill their potential, this report could not have been timed better because we're in an inflection point. We are at a pivotal point where we can really look at our institutions 
and make them better. And what I say to the young people, you know, is they, you know, all of the ills of American society. And I said, yes, true. Point me to a place that's better than this country. We have the foundation to really live up to the ideal. And as an immigrant, you know, I'm about, I don't, you know, let me put it this way. As an immigrant, our ideals were perfect. The implementation was horrible. We have been working to live up to those ideals of equality. And I think that this is the pivotal point where we can reimagine for the 21st century and beyond creating and recreating institutions, whether it's law enforcement and the relationship of law enforcement to communities, particularly communities of colors, when we deal with the inequality. You know, we have named, you know, the truck drivers essential workers. You know, the people that cut your grass essential workers. Well, who are they? They're the immigrants. They're the African Americans. They're the low paying poor. And they're the ones that are getting sick with the virus. So it's causing us to really face the reality. And I think that that's the opportunity for me. This is the time for us to embrace not only these changes, but others and reimagine and reconstruct our democracy for the future. I mean, it's really inspiring, right? I mean, I think, you know, crisis sort of shows you what you are. And what I hear you saying is it's only by really looking at what we really are that we can reconnect to our ideals, to the project in an authentic way way that will yeah. really be relevant, meaningful. I mean, Stephen, you know, I sort of want to go, because you've lived through societies in transition, societies struggling to refine a story, a set of ideals. You know, you were, you were a, a leader in civil society in Eastern Europe uh, at a time of tremendous change. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience and how it informs your thoughts on this moment? Yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting how that experience, which was a decade long, uh, engagement in Eastern Europe right after the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 has informed my thinking about American democracy. And in fact, that experience inspired me to come back to this country committed to the notion that it was time to really work on American democracy. And part of what I learned in that experience was this importance of culture and civil society. You know, if, if you look at the that 10 year history, Poland, Hungary, what was then Czechoslovakia, East Germany, they moved very rapidly after the revolutions to create the institutions of democracy, the parliaments, free and fair elections, uh, independent judiciaries, freedom of the press, you know, all the kind of basic um, institutions of, of a democratic society. And that was really exciting because it happened you know, after 40 years of oppression, it actually happened very, very quickly. But what didn't happen and what we're seeing the results of today is that they didn't focus on the democratic culture mm. or on civil society as much as they really needed to do. And, and I saw in one of the questions coming in, what's the distinction between yeah. civic culture and, and, and civil society? And so civil society is really the, the space and the organization. So it's the, it's the part, it's the sector in our society between government and the private sector where citizens can organize um, their own activities in all kinds of clubs, associations, NGOs, etc. And some of them are purely for enjoyment and, and mutual benefit like a, like a bird watching club or a book group, but some of them are about civic purpose. Um, let's let's solve this problem in our park, in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's get involved in in saving a school from being closed because of the budget process. Let's organize. Let's think together. Let's be innovative. Um, the culture is the are the attitudes and the values and the norms of behavior. It, it's what resides in the hearts and minds of the citizenry, and it gets nurtured through cultural medium, music, art, uh, movies, film, television, social media, 
plus, minus, positive, negative, but that's where the culture gets shaped. But if you don't have those norms and beliefs and values, that also weakens democracy because as John Dewey reminded us in the early part of the 20th century, democracy is a faith. It is a, it is a civic set of beliefs. Mm -hmm. And if you lose that faith, which I think many Americans have, or at least their faith is eroding in our democracy, then democracy can't survive. And you know, one, one other thing, I, if I could, Sam, just about this particular moment and, and the, the acuteness of how the racial justice legacy in our country is now so much in our faces and so importantly in our faces. The, the commission kind of takes the view that a number of historians also support that there have been really three foundings in American history. Mm -hmm. the, the first one, and, and what's interesting is they all were challenged by the question of race. Yeah. So the first founding at the end of the 18th century was, of course, the Constitution, where there was a huge compromise over race, uh, a compromise that left the issue uh, still alive and totally unresolved and created the original contradiction mm -hmm. between our aspirations and our reality. The second founding was after the Civil War with the, with the Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution. And many people say that the third founding was the Civil Rights Movement. So the second founding is in the 19th century. The third founding was in the 20th century. All three of these previous foundings were around the issue of race. And here we are today needing a fourth founding and seeing that race is still an unfinished issue in our society and it is time to finish this and move on and we will not this is my last point on this question and i'm sorry i'm going on at length here but it, it's I, I feel this so deeply we will not accomplish real racial justice in this country unless we fix our democracy and reinvent our democracy because that's the place where people's rights will be guaranteed where their participation will be valued where they should be treated equally, and where government delivers on its promises. So the moment is absolutely critical. Antonio, how do you respond to that? Well, actually, you know, absolutely. But in addition to that, in, in culture is so important. And let me make this point, because we are a country of immigrants. You know, immigrants come into our society. We don't invest in the cultural building of a culture of participating in democracy. And I'll give you some examples. When I was at Maldiv, we had a parent leadership training program. And this was to get parents engaged in the schools of their children. And so we would bring mostly all the mothers and we would say, well, in this country, you are expected to volunteer. You are expected to be part of the cleaning of the park. You know, and I had one woman say, but I have no money and I don't speak English. And I said, well, collect books in Spanish. Go to the principal and tell him to give you a shelf where you can put Spanish language, um, you know, books. And when you read to your kid, it doesn't matter that you're reading in Spanish. It's the culture of reading. If you want a soccer team, you gotta go sell tamales. You gotta go sell so you can buy the uniforms. I said, in this country, there are rights, but there's also responsibilities. And, you know, and it's not just for the immigrant community. We've done away with civics in school. We've done away with, you know, sort of um, passing on the culture of participation. It's a democracy. So to me, it's, we've gotta invest in the local engagement of the folks. And when I say citizenship, I don't mean legal citizenship. The moment a person enters our country, we need to integrate them. We need to bring them into the fabric of our life and also explain to them the expectations that we have of them. Um, and I don't think we pay that much attention uh, to this, and, and we need to do that. And this report is a perfect example for us to do that. I kind of want to spend a little time actually on this whole question of culture and, and, and sort of faith and belief that's coming up in our questions. Because I actually think it's, it's, 
it's it's hard in this moment, but it's going to be one of the softer points, I think, of how we move forward. I think, you know, there's a there as we've. I think one of the exciting things about this moment is that it's made it much easier for folks from across the ideological spectrum to find their way into a kind of the kind of historicism that you're pointing to, Stephen. Like that there that there are deep contradictions and forms of oppression and marginalization that are coded into the system that have accretive historical consequences, which has been a hard place for a lot of Americans to go because they sometimes interpret it as I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for the sins of the father. They interpret, you know, it feels like a nihilistic place, even to some well-intentioned people. But there is a version, there is a critique of that that is not reactionary and not revanchist, but sort of gets to what you guys are talking about, which is if that's the only way we define our identity, Right, and we don't have a positive vision of what it means to be an American that's adequately capacious. Then, then, then what? Then, to your point, Antonio, like, what are those responsibilities, and how do I see myself as needing to live up to them? How, in terms of faith, why would I believe in that liturgy? And, and, but what's hard in practice, right, is that some of the countries that have higher so social trust. I'm thinking of like Northern European democracies, for example that really do a lot of work around the soft expectations of citizenship, what it means to be a part of this culture, A, they tend to have a more homogenous view of that than I think we are comfortable with as Americans uh, because of, of, of our diversity. And, and B, I have to say those countries have really struggled with relatively low levels of immigration in the last couple of years to maintain that kind of civic faith. You know, it's sort of, that's sort of one of a point of optimism, I think, for Americans that we we, we can have these refoundings uh, in, in a way and we can survive them, our democracy can survive them. But how do you, how do you think about, because the commission recommendations can't really address that in a way with specificity. How do you, how, maybe first you Antonio and then you Stephen, what are, what are the restorative elements of, of a narrative of a purpose of a civic faith to you? You know, it, America, it, you know, once again, I go to my roots. Um, America is an ideal. Uh -huh. It, 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 it's not how you look, okay? It's an ideal, an ideal of believing in certain principles, the ideal of equality that we're struggling with, the ideal that we can, you know, pursue our dream, that, you know, you can come from the poorest roots, but if you, you know, really are given an opportunity, and that's the key, given the opportunity, and you put in the work, you're going to achieve, look, I'm a perfect example. As broken as the system is, my parents were illiterate. We came to this country with nothing. And out of the seven children, we're all professional, all public education. This is what this country gave us. So we have to re you know, we have to see ourselves. And you know, the interesting thing, and it's, it's a funny joke. When I'm in Mexico, I feel so American. And when I'm in the United States, I'm made to feel so Mexican mm -hmm. because I don't look yeah. like the perception of what an American is. So when they ask me, where did you come from? I say, LA, no, 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 really, where did you come from? Because I'm not perceived to be an American. And we have to embrace the fact that in America is an ideal. We're not homogeneous and the demographics are pointing in the opposite direction. Yeah. So we have to sort of, you know, sort of the ideal of, you know, that we can pursue our dream, that we believe in democracy, that we're responsible for the democracy, that we're going to be given an equal opportunity, and that we collectively engaged in our democracy can make it better. Um, it's a hard sell. It's a really hard sell, but we need to start talking about it in that way. Stephen, what do you think is restorative of a renewed civic faith? Yeah, well, you know, we, we actually have a set of recommendations around this because we, as we talked about already in this program, we did really think about culture and civil society and those, those are the places where the faith gets renewed. Um, and so one of our co-chairs is Eric Liu, who runs something called Citizen University. And one of the things that he's been um, experimenting with and innovating about are what he calls civic rituals, um, where people gather almost like going to a house of worship, but they gather uh, for um, an experience of democracy 
uh, you know, worship in essence. And, you know, you have a, he calls them civic Saturdays and there is in essence a kind of a sermon, but it is a, a civic sermon about issues and about citizens role and how they're feeling. And it, it gets very interactive and sometimes it's very celebratory and sometimes it's, it's more of a, you know, a grieving process for things that are not going well, but it is an opportunity for people to, to think more deeply about the issues rather than just going to the response, you know, the, which then be, can become quite divisive and partisan. So one of our recommendations is to, is to actually encourage more support for those kinds of innovations, to give more people the invitation and the opportunity to experiment with those kinds of civic rituals and, and um, gatherings that are focused on the ethical and the moral and spiritual foundations of democracy, because it, it is really important. A democracy only works, as Eric says, if people believe it works, and, and belief is really important. Um, I would say, you know, another part of this is that that this is a huge experiment, our democracy. It's been an experiment since the very beginning and it's gotten more complicated. And now the experiment really is, can a representative democracy of self-government actually function effectively in a huge, extremely diverse, yeah. dynamic society? Nobody's ever tried it before and, and we're struggling with it, but we're still committed to it. And um, the answer will come through a lot of civic engagement. And that is a major thrust of this report. And it will also come by helping people to, to think of the new American story. You know, we have history and some people focus on the, what, what you know, people call the gory side of American history, starting with the genocide of the native population. And then the whole history of, of racism and slavery and, and those things cannot be and should not be denied. But other people kind of focus on the glory side of the story, you know, all the great things America has done, what it stands for, you know, we prevailed against the fascists, we prevailed against the communists, whatever. And there are important accomplishments of this country, its innovation, its economy, its strength. But these two stories need to be blended into a truth yeah. as opposed to a mythology. Yeah. And we are, as one of our recommendations, working with some organizations that we hope will invite Americans into a conversation of that nature in communities all across the country between now and 2026, which is the 250th anniversary of our nation's birth. So that the American story becomes a collection of stories, not a single story, because the single story has been about white male dominance, basically. And the, and the new story has to be about all of us because that's who we are. And it, it's fundamentally important that people see themselves in that story and don't have the experience that Antonio just described of people asking her where she's from. Yeah. But you know the thing, Sam, there's a lot of hope and it, it's, it, it shows in small places. I mean, you see the volunteerism and cleaning a beach. You know, we had the disruptions here. We had the vandalism. Shortly after that happened, people out of the street came out with brooms and started, you know, sweeping this place, you know, doing that. We, we already have it. We just need to elevate it. We are a group of people that will, you know, and that's one of the thing about the coronavirus, you know, knocking on the door of the elderly family saying if they're okay, the volunteerism, we have it in our gene, it's in our DNA. We just needed to give it an opportunity to flow and to glow. And we don't give enough credit, you know, for the new generation. I see a lot of sense of volunteerism. In philanthropy, I see it a lot. I see it, you know, in people contributing, whether it's to fires, to coronavirus, to, you know, the, uh, what's happening with law enforcement. People want, what we're forgetting is people want to belong. People, you know, we have to elevate our communal, not to the detriment of the individualistic, but in this huge country of ours, 
we need to balance the sense of the individualistic independence with the need for the communal and need to bring up balance. And I think that that's what we're trying to do. I, I, th I agree with that. I mean, I, look, I think the way out of the sort of Northern European paradox is that the story is going to be emergent in America. It's not a, the, a doctrine only works in a homogenous society. In a diver society of any diversity, a doctrine becomes a dogma uh, or a myth, even, wor even worse, uh, becomes, a, becomes a myth. Uh, one of the recommendations that I was certainly an advocate for and remain excited about is um, there's a marker in there for a national trust for social and civic infrastructure, kind of the places where we come together for shared experience. And those are the places where I think the emergent story happens. Some of those places are the gory crucible of fire where that story is forged, you know, and others are, you know, to your point, like inspiring moments where the story is shaped and believed in. So I really, I mean, I, I think we all, we're all, this is the optimistic call if a pessimists you know you can log off but uh but uh um i want to we're gonna have to go so i want to i want to get out on kind of one forward-facing question we're getting a, you know, some questions about things that weren't addressed by you know electoral college mm -hmm. you know some of those things would love to know um either something that you all think was not addressed but is a, is an important topic that you would lift up in thinking about this question of of, of the future of democratic citizenship or just sort of a, a, an issue that you, sort of the next issue out there that you think we should be anticipating, the next frontier in whatever this journey or project is. Maybe Antonio, we'll start with you and then let Stephen close this out. Well, one of the things that I'm getting and I saw in the chat that already came out is the issue of the electoral, electoral college. We didn't address it directly because I, as I began to say, we wanted to be very practical. We didn't be, want to be caught up in this thing going on for years. We didn't address it directly, but we did address it indirectly. Yep. And that was through the increase of the congressional delegation by 50% to reflect a more balance. So yes, you know, were we thoroughly radical? Well, you know, to my point of view, we could have been a little bit more, but I'm very <laughs> pleased. Coming out. <laughs> I'm very pleased with you know how practical we were and if nothing else i want to live to see some of these recommendations yeah. adopted and so um you know could we have done other things yes but you know 31 recommendations is a hell of a lot yeah. too and so, and we had to narrow it down so i would say that if we do these 32 we're going to be 90 percent there <laughs> all right Stephen, what about you? What's 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 the future horizon here? Well, uh, two two things, or really three. The, on the electoral college, you know, my personal view: we should abolish the electoral college. Um, and a number of members of the commission shared that view, but there were others who didn't. Yeah. You know, there there were others who understand the original reasons for the electoral college and still think, in a, in a more conservative view of of our democracy, of our constitutional democracy, that it has a role to play. So Antonio is absolutely right. By expanding the House, you also expand the number of seats, the number of electors in the Electoral College, and they will go to the more urban states because of the population. So you begin to erode the imbalance in the Electoral College. So that's one. But there's another one that's related to it that, that we talked about that we couldn't get consensus on either, which is the structure of the United States Senate. Yes. You know, the United States Senate, each state gets two senators. And right now, and, and it, the representation is disproportionately for small states with small populations. So they now have the majority of votes in the United States Senate simply because of the structure of the Senate. And as the population continues to urbanize, the urban parts of America will continue to be really underrepresented in the Senate and the very small, you know, a state like Wyoming, which I love and it's beautiful, having two senators while California also has two. I mean, that's, that gives you a sense of, the, of yeah. the, the imbalance. But we couldn't go there either. And, you know, that's, that's fair. Um, uh, we wanted this to be a, a trans ideological report. And the fact that we got consensus on these 31 is pretty miraculous uh, in the end. And I guess I, I would close because I know our time is up. I, I just want to say that, that I think, I first I want, to, I want to confirm the optimism that you and Antonio have expressed. 
we Americans can do this. And I, again, as somebody who studied American history, think back to what Alexis de Tocqueville said after his trip through America in, uh, in the early part of the 19th century, he said, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but in her ability to repair her faults. And this is a moment when we need to do a lot more repair. Amen. Fantastic. Well, I'm not going to say anything after that. What a, what a wonderful sentiment to, uh, to end the show. You can find the report of the Commission on the Practice of Democratic Citizenship at uh, amacad.org slash our common purpose. I think we've sent it out in the chat box. We'll send it out by email. You can follow uh, the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Brothers Fund on Twitter uh, at Rock Bros Fund and the California Foundation on Twitter at Cal Fund. Um, and again, we'll get this out right after the show. But Stephen, Antonio, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having us. And thank you, Antonio. Great to be with you again. Thank to do it. All right, excellent. Before we go, I just uh, want to tell you all a little bit about what's coming up on Vision. We'll have a trio of shows uh, over the next couple of weeks about issues of speech and expression in a time of turbulence and change. Uh, on June 25th, We'll hear from Jeff Stone at the University of Chicago. He's a leading thinker uh, on free speech, particularly during times of conflict and crisis. On July 2nd, we'll hear from Dr. Wayne Frederick, the president of Howard University, and Suzanne Nossel, uh, the head of PEN America, to talk about campuses and expression. And on July 9th, we'll hear from University of Miami law professor Marianne Franks to talk about online speech. As a reminder, this episode will be up on the website tomorrow. You can see this episode in any episode on demand at kf.org slash vision. Email us at vision at kf.org or visit us on Instagram at vision.kf. Please take the survey that just popped up. And as always, we will end the show with music from Miami singer-songwriter Nick County. His music is available on Spotify. Until next week, everyone, stay safe. <laughs>